Welcome back to English 4.0, the radio show. Let's go! Advanced. Welcome back to the program. Yes, it's time for the advanced portion of class number 121. And as always, we'll get started with a little review of yesterday's material, that being class number 120. And yesterday we were talking about the... Uh, here I am again saying yesterday. In the last class, I should say, we were talking about the word without in the sense of sin. For example, he did it and he didn't complain. And you can say, well, he did it without complaining, without complaining, without followed by the gerund, right? The I-N-G. So they got to the building, but they didn't have a key. Or they got into the building. Imagine they entered the building, but they didn't have a key. I don't know how they did it. They got into the building without having a key. Okay? He had stitches in his arm, but didn't cry. So he had stitches in his arm without crying. Without crying. He left the restaurant, but didn't pay. Mm. He left the restaurant without paying. Have you ever done that? Have you ever left a restaurant without paying? Mm. Not good etiquette to leave the restaurant without paying. Mm. Although, quite easy. Not that I, I, I've never done it, but uh, quite easy to do very often. In Spain, especially, I find um, it would be very easy to leave without paying in many restaurants because sometimes you, it seems like you're, you feel like you're bothering the waiter by paying some, sometimes in a busy restaurant. And they look at you and say, well, what, what did you have? And you have to tell them. And that's something that never happens in North America. They know the bill exactly, and they're ready to give it to you as soon as you start to move. Okay, here we went inside, but didn't ask for permission first. We went inside without asking for permission first. Okay, so give me the answer out loud. I took the car, but forgot to check if it needed gas. Now, I'm saying gas because I'm from Canada. Gas, as in short for gasoline, whereas a British person would say petrol. In North America, we tend to say gasoline or gas. And I grew up, in my family, we had a diesel car. We had a Volkswagen that was a di had a diesel engine, but we still said gas. We're stopping for gas, and we weren't going to put gasoline in it because the engine will, would explode. The engine will explode if you put gasoline in a diesel engine, or at least the old ones. So, um, so but we, we would always say that, I'm stopping for gas. And uh, you typically, there's a certain vocabulary about getting gas. When you stop for gas, you typically say, it's kind of a slang, but a lot of people say it, fill her up, which means fill the tank up. Fill her, fill her, meaning fill her, which is interesting. We often refer to vehicles in the feminine, fill her up. Fill her up means fill it to the top, fill the tank. Fill her up, please. If you go to the United States or Canada as well, when you arrive at the service station, the gas station, you can come out and say, well, the, well, the attendant comes out and you say, fill her up, please. Although that has changed a lot over the last few years because now most people pump their own gas. But it used to be that you'd get service and... It's, it's strange, but I suppose it's a, th it's a thing of the past now to have someone come and pump your gas for you. Or there, there were full-service lines and self-service. So if you go to the full-service, maybe in Canada at least, you'd pay about two cents per liter more, but someone would come and pump 
your gas. So that person would come up, and you you would say to them, fill her up, and they would fill your tank. Yeah. So here, um, the example was, I took the car, but I forgot to to see if it needed gas or to check if it needed gas. So using the word without, I took the car without checking if it needed gas or without seeing if it needed gas. I went to work. It was raining last week. I went to work, but I didn't bring my umbrella. I went to work without bringing my umbrella. Hmm. They opened the door, even though they didn't have the access code. They opened the door without having the access code. They opened the door without having the access code. Okay. Now, as we move on to the second part of class number 120, we see more of the same without, except we're going to use... um, we're going to use a slightly different structure without him knowing, without her seeing, without, followed by a pronoun plus the gerund, him or her. Okay, so she did it, but she didn't know. Excuse me, she did it, but he didn't know, let's say. She did it without him knowing. He took the bag, but we didn't see. You can say, out loud, he took the bag without us seeing. It broke before he had the chance to use it. It broke without him having the chance to use it. Hmm. It changed shape, and the scientists didn't know why. They didn't know why. It changed shape without the scientists knowing why. She made him a surprise birthday cake, and he didn't know. She made him a surprise birthday cake without him knowing. It's funny. This example reminds me of a story that my mother always tells me about me because I don't, I don't remember this, but my mother always tells me this story. When I was, I guess I was three or four. I must have been, I must have been four years old, three or four. Um, it was my father's birthday, and my father was working, and he came home from work. Now, my mother had made a birthday cake, and she had put the birthday cake in the refrigerator. And she said to me, it'll be a surprise for your father. We won't tell him until after supper. We'll take it out. It'll be a big surprise. I thought, oh, great, great. So I thought, I'll keep this secret. I don't want him to know. It'll be so exciting. I loved surprises like all kids, like like most people. Everyone likes surprises. So the the, the best thing I thought I could do was as soon as my father came in the door, I ran up to him and I said, Dad, Dad, don't look in the fridge because there isn't a birthday cake in there for you. <laughs> so so it obviously it gave it away, but that's the logic of a four-year-old. I figured, hey, he'll never know. I told him that there wasn't a birthday cake, so he, he the last thing he'll do is suspect that there's a birthday cake in there, right? Anyhow, <laughs> another example, he drove off but we didn't notice. Mm. He drove off without us noticing. Now, there's another structure. We can say he drove off without our noticing. We can use the possessive form there. He drove off without our knowing. Mm. The possessive adjective, it's, it's different. He, with, without our knowing. Hmm. Uh, it changed shape and the scientists didn't know why. It changed shape without their knowing why. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, the, it's another way of expressing the same thing. I tend to do it the first way, him or her, instead of his or hers, instead of the possessive. But uh, you can say it either way. 
Okay, let's move on now to our expression of the day. Expression of the day. Ah, uh, yes, it is time for our expression of the day. The expression of the day today is just off the boat. Just off the boat. So if you are, well, if, if you're just off the boat, it essentially, it comes from the idea of an immigrant coming from a different country and being unaware of the customs of the country that they're arriving at. So if you say he's just off the boat, means he has just arrived. But we use this to say, we, we should say, hey, do you think I'm just off the boat? Meaning, do you think I'm, I'm, I'm unaware of the customs? In other words, I'm saying, you can't fool me. Because sometimes in business or in a, in, a, in a deal or in a sale, someone will try to trick the other person. And that person, if they sense that they're being tricked, they'll say, look, I'm not foolish. I'm not new here. I know that you're charging me too much. I'm not just off the boat means I'm not unaware of the prices. I'm not unaware of the reality here. So to be just off the boat, to be new in a place, and therefore maybe a little bit naive or, or, or unknowing of the reality. So just off the boat is our expression today. And now I'd like to move on into class number 121. And here we have a phrasal verb. In fact, two phrasal verbs, which mean in Spanish, calmarse, okay, which are to, to settle down, tranquilizarse, to settle down, or also in English, to calm down. So to settle down is typically with a group of people. Imagine there's a concert. Imagine a concert and a famous musician, Bruce Springsteen, he performs one song, and then they're, they're, they're cheering, they're cheering, they're cheering, and he has to wait for them to settle down before he says something. He wants to say something, but he says, I'll wait until they settle down. Okay? Calm down is very similar, but calm down, typically someone, is, someone is, has been agitated. They've been bothered, and, they're, and the opposite is to calm down. So... So if someone's very angry, you could say, calm down, calm down, take it easy, relax, calm down. And finally, with time, they calm down. Okay? So did you wait for them to settle down before starting the show? Imagine for a minute that you're Bruce Springsteen. Hey, Bruce, did you wait for them to settle down before starting the show? Yes, I waited for them to settle down before starting the show. Mm -hmm. Have you ever told anyone to calm down in a in a violent situation? Imagine they got in a bit of a in a bit of a fight over something. You had to tell them to calm down. Did you ever have to tell anyone to calm down or to settle down? Either one, you could say, "Calm down, calm down, calm down." Okay, take it easy, calm down. Okay, so we have to calm, C A L M. Calm down, settle down. And very similar. There's, these two are, are really quite similar. Okay? So, um, ask me if John calmed down by the time the police arrived. Hey, Kyle, did John calm down by the time the police had arrived? Yes. He calmed down by the time the police had arrived. Yes, he calmed down. He realized he's, he was less agitated. He got more tranquilo, let's say. He became more relaxed. So to calm down. All right? We'll review this tomorrow, but I want to move on now and take a look at our vocabulary of the day. Vocabulary of the day. All right, it's time for the vocabulary of the day. Our five words of vocabulary. The first is a verb, which is the verb prever in Spanish. In English, we say to foresee. To foresee. Mm. 
it's almost like a prediction here. I foresee economic growth over the next three years, for example. Sin importancia. Well, if it doesn't have a if it doesn't have importancia, it doesn't have meaning, it is meaningless. Meaningless. Masticar. This verb is the verb to chew. Chew. Yesterday I chewed, lately I have chewed. I never chew gum on the radio. It's true, I never chew gum. I, on the radio, I, I do sometimes chew gum, but not on the radio. Grappa. Grappa. This is a staple. And staples go into the stapler, and they're used to staple papers. Finally, hombre de estado. This is a statesman. A statesman. Yeah, hombre de estado. Statesman. All right, we only have about one minute left. But I want to move on and try two or three examples from our translation list. Translation. All right, we're running short on time, so I'm going to make this fast. Translation list number 39. Si todo va según lo previsto... If everything goes as planned, if everything went as planned, I would have had more time for this list. But I'm out of time. Do I have time for one more, Nacho? One more. All right. He's, he's saying I've got time for one more. Se ha demostrado una y otra vez que no es posible. It's been proven time and time again. That it's not possible. It's been proven time and time again that it's not possible. All right. We have 10 more sentences, but we're all out of time. So I'm going to finish there, but I promise you tomorrow I'll return to this list, number 39. So at home, study it. Also, you can review it today on the television. So study the list. And we'll come back to this and review it in its entirety tomorrow. We'll see you then. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.